and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe podcast. This is David Bonson. I'm here with the entire investment committee of the Bonson Group, and we're going to have a little conversation this morning about the role of politics in your investment portfolio. And who would have thought that investing would be the simpler of the two topics, because I don't know that it can get much more uh, heated, toxic, opinionated, controversial than all the realms related to politics, particularly in this day and age. So welcome, Brian Julian, Dea Robert. Um, here I'm going to set the table for us a little and then let you guys uh, go to town. Mm. Uh, my um, belief is that we're about to go for a full calendar year where investors are going to have more trepidation around their investment positioning because of fears about politics than we've ever had. And it is going to be completely two-sided. 50% of people will say, I am very skeptical about my investment outlook because what if Donald Trump is reelected and he's a loose cannon and he's impeachable and there's a trade war and he tweets too much? And then 50% will say, I'm completely paralyzed with fear because what if Donald Trump loses and Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders and... And Karl Marx are all elected in an aggregate milieu of collectivism to tax us and bring us back into the, the dark ages of economic prosperity. Chances are that both sides will be somewhat hyperbolic in their fears. But again, the point being significant fears from both sides of the political aisle. More so than Obama, these as far because it's on both sides, is that what well, you're saying? Well, now or, here's the thing. Or? Here's the thing that I'm going to say. So, Day has done a good job to help us get a little historical context mm -hmm. around this. Uh, when Obama was running for the first term, um, I don't think people were saying in September of 08, "Hey, if Obama's elected, the market's going to crash." Because the market was down 50 percent. Down a little bit. And so the fear, there were obviously very strong opinions about the hope and change he could represent politically or the awful things he could represent, radicalism and leftism he could represent politically. People had their own views around Obama as a presidential candidate. But I don't think in the campaign there was a lot of fear around it. After he was elected and you had a massive move down mm -hmm. in the market. But you were in the middle of the financial crisis, and there was a point I'll never forget, um, both him and Tim Geithner being on the screen like, at the same time, and Geithner would go would talk, and the market would drop 500 points, and Obama would talk and drop 500. But again, that you can't really attribute that to the politics of the moment, because we were going through the financial crisis, Brian. You remember it I well. Yeah. But I will say, and again, I'm kind of jumping mm -hmm. ahead now at Dea's uh, prodding, I think that definitely there are a lot of people, once all the dust settled, that then you got into 2009, 10, and 11, and they said, look, he's the le most left-wing president. They want higher taxes. He's Obamacare. Mm -hmm. and, and we don't have to point to this hypothetically or, or using rhetoric. Actual legislative activity, the Obamacare represents the largest entitlement ever passed in American history, the Dodd-Frank bill, the most strict and constricting form of financial regulation ever in American history. And then you had the stimulus bill, which which was almost a trillion dollars of, of spending. And so there was a lot of fear around these things. Now, um, I, 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 I want to jump into the discussion of it. Mm -hmm. I'll come back to that kind of political, uh, to that, that point. But really, Dea, honestly, I think that the level of concern um, politically – then was all one-sided. It was only people on the right who didn't like Obama. I was one of them. I'm a, I'm a conservative guy. I didn't care for him as president, but I didn't believe he was going to be tanking markets because markets are already trading at 11 times. Yeah. And earnings had troughed at 50 bucks in the S&P. Couldn't get any worse. Could, yeah. and, and the Fed was throwing candy around like it was Halloween. You yeah. know? And so I didn't share their views, but it does represent, I guess, kind of a lot of where this conversation is going and where the politics and the investment outlook have got to be separated. So, so Brian, uh, you were managing money during the Obama years. Uh, we formed our partnership uh, at some point along the way, even going back further uh, throughout history. Is the next 12 months different? Should investors have a political fear about their portfolio? 
So uh, generally, the answer is no. Um, we look at you know political landscape and what's going on in the world and politics, and it's sort of a you know a, a headwind or a tailwind with what we're doing um, as far as allocations and managing money and, and all of that. But as far as it changing something for people, um, what they're trying to accomplish and their goals and those types of things, I would say absolutely not. You would not be changing things based on what may or may not happen. There is no crystal ball, and so we stick with fundamentals. Fundamentals don't change overnight. Mm-hmm. Um, Julian, tell me, do you believe when you think about the stuff, the angst that would normally enter the fray around politics and policy impacting a portfolio, uh, affecting the overall economy, what have you, do you think there's something unique around this coming election in this field of candidates? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I'm not the best place to judge the, the, the candidates, but I'm just looking at um, um, at history. I mean, this you know, you're still in a country with uh, two uh, dominant parties with check and balances. It's nothing like you know the UK going to a referendum to leave the European Union. That's a big deal. That's something you know they've decided to do. And after I don't know if it's 50 years in a in a union, so this is just like the normal course of politics, I guess. And uh, and what's interesting is if you look, you know, I was trying to look at some studies um, uh, online and then basically it's like it's more, what's more important is like what it does to your, uh, to your, uh, to your mood as, you know, being on one side, you know, a Republican or being a Democrat. And it sounds like basically there's some studies that have proven that, you know, if people uh, are more optimistic and perceive a market to be less risky, and more undervalued when their own party wins. So then they're more optimistic, then they don't trade as much, and they end up doing better than if you, you feel like you lost the election and you're worried about you know, some, someone being elected that's not in your party. Then you're going to be scared, and you're going to want to uh, trade out. It's going to, you're going to do some mistakes. So in other words, I think what you're saying is that when the party you wanted is in office, there's a self-fulfilling prophecy because you are less susceptible to doing stupid things behaviorally. Exactly. And I guess that's not, I mean, that's something I'm saying, but that's a, uh, it's based on a study that was uh, done in 2009 that's called Political Climate, Optimism, and Investment Decisions. So it's, I guess it's been proven empirically. Yeah. 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 And I think that there's two dimensions to this as well. Number one is, do the politics actually affect the fundamentals? Mm. And then number two is, do these political headlines incentivize the right kind of investor behavior? And uh, I, so I, I think that there's a clear distinction there. For the first part, uh, do politics affect the fundamentals? I thought I was actually going to be uh, somewhat – our group does do a lot of uh, political content or does produce a lot of political content. And uh, I think that is it is important. Some some areas of the policy uh, is important to look at, but in general, I don't think it matters at all. And uh, I'm going to go for, as far as to say is, out of maybe a hundred different uh, political headlines you may see a year, maybe one of them might matter to fundamentals. And I just have a list here of a, a lot of political headlines from this year, and uh, I'm just going to read them off to you and and. Let me see if the listeners still remember, if they mattered, if they didn't matter or whatever. Uh, okay, this is in January and then going all the way down. Pelosi resigns. Speaker of the House shutdown continues. Los Angeles teachers strike. Government shutdown continues. Uh, President Trump declares national emergency. U.N. ambassador picked. Trump's border wall emergency d- denied. President Trump or Trump gives speech regarding Mueller. Uh, President Trump signs a free speech executive order. House fails to override Trump veto. Uh, and there's uh, there's about 20, 10 or 20 more of these. My point is, is that I don't believe if you are a long-term investor that these political headlines matter at all. Uh, it It is true that a lot of, uh, there there are some policies that do matter. And I know David uh, talks ad nauseum about how uh, certain policies may affect the supply side of things, may affect business confidence, may affect trade. Uh, and those are the policies that I think do matter. And anything mm-hmm. that promotes markets, uh, I think is is pol- is a policy to pay attention to. So, yep. I, I would I would largely agree with you, and I think um, philosophically as well. However, I do want to play maybe devil's advocate a little bit. Um, you know, there's there's been an increasing tendency these days to legislate through the executive branch, right? We've seen a, a big deregulation push in the in the Trump administration. Things can happen that do affect fundamentals at, at that level. I mean, think of the you know the proposal for a while to uh, index capital gains to inflation, right? That mm-hmm. would have a, a meaningful effect on a lot of security prices. So I don't want to say that there there isn't there isn't anything 
that can affect it. It, all, it also didn't happen. That's right. Yeah, it it's, that's happen. correct. Yeah. So it's just another one of those those headlines that didn't come to transpire. But I think but, largely but that would be an example of a meaningful. They're, they're, they're blips. Right. They're, I mean, right. if you if you kind of take a wider view, they're just not it's it's something, something to read about. Yeah. It's hard to really well, position around them. Yeah. In anticipation yeah. of something. That's like right. That too, that's right. You know, because it can go either way. Capital gain inflation, you know, index may or may not happen. Doesn't look like it's no, going to. No. But yeah. You know, so it's it's more about you know would we change what we're doing in anticipation of something in the political landscape? Mm-hmm. Um, potentially, it would be something that we would discuss, but I don't think we well, would implement. Well, let me suggest that we get even more granular than that, and instead of just saying would we incorporate politics, say would we incorporate the four different categories? Okay, mm-hmm. so so um, to take your point that it's how it impacts fundamentals. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to suggest the four categories would be legislative mm-hmm. realities out of the political scene. Two would be the point you're bringing up, which is things that can get done at the executive branch level. Three would be the rhetoric, okay, the mood, the tone, which I think is where the biggest skepticism about market prospects came from during President Obama, is even though most of the things happening under the water were good for markets with earnings troughing and recovering, with Fed providing a lot of monetary stimulus, with recovery off of the financial crisis. The fact of the matter is, is that a lot of people said it can't be good because Obama says he's coming after the banks with pitchforks Mm. and there was this sort of uh, anti-enterprise messaging. So the legislative reality, the executive branch reality, which is largely regulatory, the rhetoric, and then the fourth category is what people just think of the candidate. Are they just do they like the candidate? So let's just start with that one because I think that's the easiest one for us to shoot down. I have no interest as chief investment officer of this company in infecting a client's portfolio based on whether or not we think someone's a good president or a bad president. They can be bad or good legislatively with markets. They can be bad or good executive, but just in general, if you say I don't like the judges or I do like the judges or I don't like their stance on social issues, I don't like his Twitter, I do like his Twitter, all those things matter. As citizens, all those things matter to the way an investor may feel about the political climate, either positively or negatively. But that's the one that I think most of the conversation comes from. That's where most of the heat is. Mm. And that's the one that is easiest for me to say, I don't care. I don't care. It's immaterial. Are we in agreement on that? Yeah. Yeah. So then the other three, legislative, executive, tone. Let's start with the tone one, because you remember what I'm talking about with the Obama years. I do. He said, now is not the time to go to Las Vegas. Yeah. And that's where the SkyBridge Alternative Conference came from, was because Anthony Scarmucci said, oh, this poor town is getting decimated by recession. Let's bring a big, b- bunch of big spenders back to Vegas and get tips going for the bartenders and the valet and all yeah. this stuff. And, and it turned around. The biggest well, yeah. bottom and turn around. So they well, did I, it. Believe me, I, as somebody who's been at that conference every year, a lot of economic activity is taking place. <laughs> sure. But my point is, does tone and rhetoric matter? And if it does, how does it matter in our investment process? Does tone and rhetoric matter in our investment process? Um, no, um, I would say much less so. Does it matter overall? Well, to the extent it can change, you know, habits and, and um, trends of, of, of consumers, then I would say absolutely. Um, but again, we're going to look at the numbers, not so much as a tone or a rhetoric or a feeling part of it, but more how is it actually coming into earnings or consumer consumer sentiment and you know those types of things. So it can matter, uh, uh, but but as far as what we're doing day to day, it doesn't. Less so marginally. Marginally, Julian. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's um, it can create volatility. It can you know make us talk about this all day, but at the end of the day, uh, it's probably least likely to have any impact on fundamentals and valuation. So I guess legislative and you know executive order is probably m- much more important. Hmm. Yeah, I think uh, I think tone and rhetoric uh, matter. Maybe in the sh- in the short term, as far as maybe some might have some correlation markets. As far as long term trends go, uh, that that's primarily what we focus on and what Brian said. I mean, if this is affecting culture, if uh, the rhetoric is, let's give an example, is a bit socialist, and we, we there's there's data just, out just there. Just as an example, just as an example, <laughs> like, like yeah, hypothetically, <laughs> <laughs> and there's data out there that shows that you know uh, policies are are becoming more and more oriented towards redistribution or whatever it is. I think that could cause us to look differently, potentially at different sectors. But that's some, that's a long that's an example of a long term trend. Yeah. yeah, I think qualitatively, you can you can say that politically, maybe certain sectors or even certain companies might be under fire in, in the, the mm-hmm. year ahead, perhaps. But yeah. again, we look at the numbers. I mean, every single company has different exposures to some of those qualitative mm-hmm. factors. 
So I, I think we're all kind of mostly saying the same thing, but I sort of want to add to it and see if you guys are uncomfortable with my addition. I would suggest that rhetoric has very little impact when it's negative, but potentially some impact when it's positive, meaning that there is a sense in which business confidence and business investment mm -hmm. and uh, human action, which I believe is what the study of economics is, that it is more prone to activity and sort of what they talk about the animal spirits of capitalism when there is a positive um, message in the marketplace. But then when there is a negative one, I think I don't think you get the positive message, but I don't think that the negative message has the same impact. In other words, I'm mm -hmm. suggesting a sort of heads we win and tails we don't lose that much asymmetry around it. That if, if let's just say, for example, Bernie Sanders says, we want to ta tax all rich people heavily, and I'm not being unfair to him. That's kind of part of his message. I think that the market and the environment of the country is more likely to say, no, you're not. But if uh, President Trump w came in and said, we want better opportunity for small business, we want more CapEx, we're going to have corporate tax reform, and we could even go back to President Reagan in the 80s and to really be fully nonpartisan or bipartisan about it, what was Bill Clinton's famous line? The era of big government is over. That was his line. It was a very pro-business. You remember he had Bob Rubin as Secretary of Treasury. Mm -hmm. Greenspan was an old Ayn Randian running the Fed. Um, you, so I think that whether it was from Reagan to Clinton to Trump, you had a bit more animal spirits that were, were rhetorically beneficial to markets. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think that the negative rhetoric can kill markets, but I think the positive rhetoric can help markets. Does anyone think I'm being too Pollyannish here? No, I think that that's fair. I mean, I think the negative rhetoric can can affect markets a little as well. But like you said, I think it's a little bit skewed more towards the other. To towards the, policy. To, more to, yeah, more well, towards and that's, policy. Well, that's a fair point, Brian. I, I, this is probably what I should say. The negative rhetoric doesn't hurt markets if people believe it's just rhetoric. Right. right. Yeah. So if, in other words, at the point at which Obama was saying some of the most anti-market stuff the Republicans are already taken back the House. Mm -hmm. And the market had the ability to just say, well, OK, so he he wants to go after bankers with pitchforks. Not, it's not going to happen. Can't, can't get it done. Yeah. And so I think that the Newt Gingrich, Bill Clinton stalemate, the Ronald Reagan, Tip O'Neill stalemate, and I think that the John Boehner, Barack Obama stalemate kind of offset the rhetoric. The rhetoric of Liz Warren or Bernie Sanders becomes more concerning if they also have 70 mm. people sharing that rhetoric in the U.S. Senate. What yes. do you think, Jordan? Yes. No, I was thinking about like what happened in 2008 being like, uh, probably we should talk about that as like very important political decision where, I mean, you know, you decided to let Lehman go bust and you may, that's where they draw the line. You could have decided to not any, any bank go bust and wouldn't have that big, uh, um, probably a crisis. Or you could have decided to have a few more banks go bust. You know, it would have been much worse. So this was a huge political decision. And it sounds to me like that's probably even more important than any, you know, wh who's going to be the next president. And like, but is what that a, is that a hundred year flood issue? Like, in other words, um, it, the issue mm. there around Lehman, I don't think was political at all. It was it, 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 you had free marketeers and Hank Paulson deciding to go bail out AIG. They had a range fed financing for Bear Stearns. They let one bank go under. There was no amount of financing. Yeah, I think that there's maybe a difference of opinion on it. I believe that they knew City, B of A, other companies themselves were insolvent, and they said, let's let Lehman be the scapegoat. They got to go down. They were functionally insolvent. There was no capital hole they could fill. But but again, in that case, if there were politics involved, it would have been contrarian to their political impulses, not in line with it. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, 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 the people who passed TARP, were were Republicans that w were going to drive it. It was mm -hmm. it was Hank Paulson begging Nancy Pelosi for the votes to do a seven hundred billion dollar mm -hmm. bailout. So I think all those and it was Schumer and Barney Frank mm -hmm. that were kind of originally anti TARP. They came around, but you had everyone's sort of political instincts were kind of off kilter because of the hundred year flood that was the financial crisis. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. I think so. I think your hundred year flood thing is a good analogy. I mean, it's a black swan. It doesn't doesn't happen all that much. But you're right. I mean, in the Lehman thing, they didn't have a buyer for Lehman either. So I think there were some other things there too. But 
Um, yeah, I agree. Like, yeah. you know, unless the Fed, unless the, the U.S., yeah. but they have no legal authority. To yeah. buy sure, them. sure. But I guess after Lehman, you know, when they saw the, the stress they put in the system, letting Lehman fail, they had to, you know, and then they decided to intervene. They could have said, okay, let's uh, let's let another one or two fail. Yeah, yeah. but again, I, I, I honestly believe that that represents a real outlier in political convention. No, for sure, yeah. It doesn't line up with any partisanship. There was just a bunch of people throwing fingers yeah. over holes in the dam that makes it harder to trace. But, yeah, to political... but I guess I, I want to say, I think in this, in this moment that is like really critical probably to focus on politics and understand, you know, what, what, what these people are willing to do. Are they willing to let the whole system collapse or not? Because then you will have to really tactically probably do something about it. I think, yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't know that systemic breakdown of the system is the biggest issue that's going to affect politics in the coming years. But, I, I think that those things, the banks are so yeah. delevered. Yeah. It's a very different world. <laughs> to, yeah. ge to generalize. Julian's going to scare uh, the hell out yeah. of our yeah. <laughs> No, what I'm saying is like, it's no, no, nice. I, I, I mean, I feel it, like yeah. this, this is something, you haven't had to worry about that in this country for a long time and this is great. But, I, you know, you look at other jurisdiction, you look at the UK, you look at, you know, you can, you can have Here's so Here's a like, list of presidents that would bail out the financial system if the entire thing were collapsing. Elizabeth Warren, All Bernie of. Sanders, <laughs> Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, George Bush, Hank Paulson, Julian... <laughs> <laughs> Mitchell Bonson, but uh, they all would. Yeah, but yeah, I yeah. think that the, rather than those kind of you know outlier events, let's go back to those categories about legislative and executive. Robert brought up the executive branch that now they have a lot more authority around regulatory and enforcement. Brian's response was accurate that yes, yeah, but it's kind of transitory. You know, Obama was blocking production of a bunch of oil and gas pipelines, and that was hurting that sector. Trump came in and approved it. It helped the sector. But as long as things are not being done legislatively, it's as good as the next four years kind of right. goes. However, I think that the overall deregulatory climate, both in financials, energy, EPA, a lot of things were a big part, perhaps just as much as the corporate tax reform, tax reform. As, as for the reason for the huge move up in the stock market under Trump in the first year and a half of his presidency. Um, on the flip side, a negative aspect, all at the executive branch level has been the trade war. Mm -hmm. He, for whatever reason, I happen to totally disagree with it constitutionally. Congress has delegated to the president control over these trade arrangements, and he doesn't need now. Look at the look at the dichotomy. We're waiting around for the House to pass NAFTA 2.0, right. but we're sitting here waiting for Trump and Xi to get a deal done on China. And yet they're both trade arrangements. It's just that we have said treaties go through the House and everything, trade packs go through the executive branch. So my question is, legislatively, I think we can all concur that on a temporal executive level, that probably the markets would prefer President Trump be reelected versus some of the more far left Democrat candidates. And that those things are not the primary movers of the market, but they affect it. But legislatively, I'm going to list three things that are heavy on the Democratic platform, and let's discuss how that may impact our, our client portfolios or not impact it, mm. as the case may be. Medicare for all, somewhere between $30 trillion and $70 trillion of additional government spending on a kind of universal health care system in the United States, depending on the candidate. Student loan forgiveness, wiping away a trillion and a half dollars of student loan and, and basically promising free higher education to all go forward. I don't believe in fairness that that's in the plank of every Democrat candidate, but it is in the case of Warren and Sanders. And then uh, third, what should we focus on here? A wealth tax, just a stronger, stricter taxation around uh, balance sheet wealth in the country. So anti-supply side and anti uh, and just very redistributionist. Legislatively, with those three things coming from a president, scare us in our investment positioning. Um, I don't know if scare is the right word. <clears throat> Disappointed, maybe. I don't know yeah. the right word. But would it would it cause us to rethink positioning? I think it would cause. Um, Evaluations to come under scrutiny, particularly in the equity market, just as a whole. Um, I think it would be bad for markets and personally bad for the country. The way that I look at things, um, I think everybody's got their own opinion on that. But I'm yeah. going to skip ahead to Robert because I have a feeling Robert's going to get the trick in the question, and and I don't want to. Um, I'm not purposely trying to do a trick question. Would markets be scared of a president feeling this way legislatively? I mean, markets are individual actors across the board, so I I don't. I don't care what markets think because this is an opportunity if they get scared for us. 
You know, the, True. these things are, can well, I comment on a couple why of Why would it be an opportunity as opposed to a the, death sentence? The, uh, okay, a wealth tax, to my knowledge, isn't constitutional, so it's kind of a non-starter. How would you even value assets to, to tax them? So that's not not happening. The, the student loan issue, you know, that's something worth discussing. I think there'll be fixes around that. Is that something to, to scare markets? Not necessarily. I don't think that's going forward either. Um, okay, so well, let me, yeah, the yeah, yeah, let me talking yeah. about it and having it being a legislative is kind of disconnected yeah. just because it would still have to pass. So someone can talk yeah. about taxing everybody. So, over so let, let's dollars, say someone ignored the first. Happen, no. so. If you ignored the first twenty minutes of the podcast yeah. and you're going to ignore the next ten minutes, here's the one sentence Brian just boiling down for us. You you can't evaluate the concern to markets around a president's campaign speech only around what you actually think will happen. And the reason why wealth tax, Medicare for all, and what was the other one I said? Student loans. Student loans. Um, it would not be a threat to markets is because the markets would not take seriously the idea that it would became, become law. Therefore, the hedge, the put option that you have long in your portfolio is named Alexander Hamilton and James Madison, the separation of powers in the United States Constitution that keeps the ability of a presidential candidate to do those types of things they say they want to do. Am I right or am I wrong, Dan? Yeah, absolutely. And it's uh, something that Julian mentioned early on, why politics matter, those headlines matter less in this country is because of the way our founding fathers set up our government very brilliantly, brilliantly excuse me, to limit, uh, to limit those, uh, you know, people who, who want to abuse their power. What like if you had too. a wave election and you end up with 60 Democrat senators okay. and 300 <laughs> Democrat House? See, I still make the same argument, oh, okay. just like yeah. you did out of 2008, that then they passed Obamacare. There's a number of things that happened. And then 63 Democrats were thrown out of the House two years later. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, you could very well, I don't know, none of us know if Elizabeth Warren's to be elected or not and if the Democrats are going to take the Senate or not. I don't know. But I do know this. If they do, the legislation that they advocate is not liked by 70% of the country. So if Medicare for All were to pass, it will be thrown out one year later because we have congressional races every two years in our country. So that, again, comes back to the system of government being the best hedge that we have. You follow what I'm saying? I do. And I, you know, I, I agree. And I think the one thing we haven't talked about as, as a potential outcome is we're talking about the election and how to, you know, construct your portfolios and all of that. We haven't talked about the word impeachment yet, so I thought I would open that that up here a little bit, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is is the um, let's assume that Democrats are going to go forward with this. Let's assume hypothetically that President Trump is going to really fight against it. I don't know if he will or not. <laughs> okay, okay. he yeah. obviously will. So here's the question: Does that elevate portfolio volatility? And before I answer, I'd like to point out the market is up 350 points since the announcement was made last Tuesday about mm. this impeachment inquiry. Yeah, yes, it elevates market volatility, but I, I think this was a catastrophic mistake. I, 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 I disagree with you on that. On, the, on the mistake aspect? No, on no, the, no, on the, on the volatility. The on the volatility. Oh. I, I, think, I don't think the I don't market's care You think all. it's taken in stride at this point? It's a charade. Go, going well, forward. you know what's funny? You yeah. said this at the beginning of the year. I don't want to cut you off no, here, no, no, but, yeah. but remember that we were talking about, does Trump have a discount or a premium to the market, basically? So mm. if Trump goes away, Pence comes in, does that mean things are going to be more volatile? There's going to be you know more kind of shooting from the hip policy type of thing or less? And I would argue that there's probably less. I think short term there'd be volatility, but well, I think what it, we, you you said it. I don't know if it's on air in an article a couple, couple years back. You said what would the market be doing if not for Trump? You know, yeah. for all these business friendly policies and whatnot. But him getting on Twitter is is kind of damaging in some respects. So that's what Brian's bringing yeah, up. Is yeah. I was arguing Trump was not getting a premium to market; he was getting a discount. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that's mostly right. But I think as it pertains to the the, the impeachment stuff, I think it significantly elevates political volatility, societal no. volatility dinner table volatility, uh, Twitter volatility. Probability of a China trade deal? I think it increases yeah. probability of a China trade deal, mm -hmm. but I think that markets from the Mueller investigation, uh, you go back to the Lewinsky impeachment in 1998, um, and people say, well, yeah, but look at when they were Ford, when Nixon was under the investigation, markets yeah. were tanking. And Oil embargo. Okay. And well, I don't know, a <laughs> mass recession, 9% yeah. inflation. Right. It's a you, little, you know, little, little it's just, secular bear market to begin with, the whole thing. Just, exactly. I just don't think it has teeth either. I mean, aside from all that stuff, but he also hasn't been necessarily. A, you have you know Adam Schiff and all these congressional Democrats that are saying this or that. They've said those same things for for years now about the Miller stuff. So 
until there's someone that actually attacks him on valid points, I don't think it's going to increase volatility, but I think it will at those junctures. So if there's a debate and they talk about, oh, you did this or that in Ukraine, I think it'll, you know, create a little activity in the market temporarily, but not over the, the long term. But the, but the Mueller investigation didn't from no. day one to the last day. It really yeah. didn't. Yeah. This is also why it's so difficult to link uh, what's happening politically to markets is that we don't know whether Trump's going to get impeached or not. I, I assume no, but mm. but then you have to play out this the, the second and third order effects. Mm. Uh, like mm. Brian said, like maybe this whole uh, noise about impeachment caught, facilitates some sort of U.S.-China trade deal, which would be beneficial mm -hmm. for So it's so difficult to analyze, number one, what's going to happen and how the linkage to actually how it affects the market. And to pretend to know uh, with, with a high degree of confidence exactly how the market's going to react to something and if something's going to happen, I, th I think is a bit ludicrous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Julian, do you think there's a sense where the Fed plays a role into this? Does elevated political volatility make the Fed more likely to act? I have been wanting to write a white paper for a long time about what I believe was the Fed uh, FOMC meeting that changed history. That was October of 1998, where we had 5.4% GDP growth and uh, Greenspan cut the discount rate, uh, cut the Fed funds rate 50 basis points. And that at that point, the, what Greenspan put became really codified in American economics. It, it, the impeachment of Clinton was going on, but as Dave is bringing up, it's hard to find um, post hoc yeah. ergo propter hoc because you had um, Asian crisis, mm -hmm. you had Russian ruble, you had yeah. long term capital management. Mm -hmm. But does, if anything, does it just sort of provide a little more rationale for the Fed to kind of play into this insurance cut nonsense? Um, yeah, I, I mean, the Fed is theoretically, you know, supposed to focus on employment, unemployment and inflation. That's really the mandate they have. But clearly, they are, they're looking at so many other data. And so I guess they, um, you know, it's, uh, it's just looking at how they reversed, you know, last year policy with two cuts already this year. It's pretty clear that they're very closely following uh, what's happening, you know, uh, in Washington, I think, and, uh, and the impact they can have on the economy uh, with the tariffs. Uh, it's yeah. pretty much a cut based, you know, that's, uh, that's a response to the tariffs, I think. So fast forward, let's pretend it's uh, January of 2020. And on a Tuesday, the headline is House impeaches Clinton. And on a Wednesday, the headline is China and U.S. announced generational trade deal. You mean, Which you one mean, moves the market to a higher magnitude? Impeach Trump. Trump. Yeah. Well, but I said House. Oh. Okay? okay. And that's a very important thing, by the way. I will offer the political consensus as my economic and market view, which okay. is that the House will end up impeaching Trump and Trump. the Senate okay. will not end up removing mm -hmm. him. Yeah. I would say that there's a 99% chance the Senate will not remove him and that there is a 60%, 65% chance the House will impeach him. Sort of like the Clinton thing. Yes, and, yeah. and all the, the yeah. only ones we've ever had. Yeah, yeah markets so, would be up on that. I, I mean, honestly, I think that they would. On the China news. Yeah. I the think China they, I news think would impact would. markets more than the House impeachment. I do. Yeah. Yeah. I think, it's priced in. It's the, very, priced in the fact that mm -hmm. the, the impeachment is never going to succeed, right? I think it's priced in. Like, yeah, nobody can see it work. Yeah. Emergency Third and fourth orders. This is something that we talk about yeah. a lot internally. We should share with our listeners. It's not just the news itself. It's what comes out of it. So you say, okay, House impeaches Trump. But then we're answering the question as if that's the news. But we have to look to the third and fourth order. Is Trump polling at 20%? Or is he polling at fifty one percent? See yeah. if it, well, but yeah. at the time, that's yeah. what the right. the, the, yeah, the, the crux time, sure. would be. That to me is the bigger question. Well, will his policies become undone before you know with, with the mm -hmm. next takeover? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that that would ha that would be likely to happen either. And so that's why I think when we talked earlier, I think markets would actually be up, N not necessarily on the news of impeachment, but up if there was a China trade a trade deal as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so there overall, isn't. let's wrap up just some summary points. Some of you guys already made some of this about how clients ought to be thinking about it, regardless what side of their aisle. Now, look, I think that mo anyone listening to this probably knows that I tend to lean right and have a lot of strongly held political views, and I manage money very agnostically around um, what I believe ought to be the case, but manage money very not agnostically about what I think is the case. I want and owe clients ROI regardless of what I happen to like or not like. That's why we dismiss that fourth category of this subject. But in the context of everything we've been talking about here today and our beliefs about how clients ought to be allocated, I'm respecting the fact that there are people 
that are adamant that Trump being around more is bad for markets. Mm-hmm. And there were a lot of people felt that way going in 2017. And we'd have we'd have meetings in 2017 and dinner events. The market was up huge. And people would say, I don't understand how the market's up huge. Trump's tweeting this stupid stuff. And I'd say, the only, well, you answered your own question. The market is up and Trump is tweeting this. So therefore, the markets don't care, right? <laughs> so I, whether your fear is, I don't want Trump or I don't want Liz Warren, Bernie Sanders, whoever, uh, that it's reasonable in American society that people fit in one of those two buckets. Um, I happen to be a guy, by the way, I think this is fair to say, and you guys can share whatever you want. It doesn't matter uh, th- that um, I, I don't like the idea of a far left person being president. And I'm very, very disappointed in a lot of the ways Trump, President Trump handles himself. And I think both those things can be true at one time. Sure. How the American people feel about it in November 2020. Well, that's a pretty big question. I don't know mm-hmm. the answer. But 130 million people are going to vote on that question and we'll know more then. Mm-hmm. But along the way. My view is that we have to look at the politics, understand it, but understand it around legislative realities for primarily, executive realities secondarily, tone and rhetoric third, and not at all the popularity contest of nightly politics. Anything to add to that? Everyone add to it. Go around the circle. No, and I would just say as far as um, you know, wanting to do something or make a decision that's important based around something that you cannot predict perfectly like – a, geo, a political outcome of some kind. I, I just don't think that it's prudent. The politi- I, you can't predict the political outcome and you can't predict how the market will react to that political that's outcome. That's true. Yeah. Both that's true. Can be true. Yeah. So at the end of the day, it comes back to what each individual person's goal is and how that is affected by what may or may not come down the pike in the political landscape. And for the most part, many times it just doesn't change those fundamentals. Um, I was going to say check and balances really work well in this country. And then just like in the... They should try it in other countries too. Well, actually, I was thinking about uh, <laughs> what happened in France in 81. There was, for the first time, a socialist president elected and they even had some communist... Uh, uh, Mitterrand. Mitterrand. Mitterrand, yeah, exactly. And then, so he was elected and he, he lasted two years. Uh, well, I guess he lasted seven years, but his, his uh, socialist policies only lasted two years. Uh, two years later, the whole uh, population was so against it that he reversed to more like, uh, you know, capitalist and more market-friendly uh, um, policies and changed the whole government, kicked out the communists. So, you know, even whatever happens in the election, it's not, you know, it's just, you know, you will have another one two years later and, you know, uh, yeah, it, it'll change very fast. So, Great point. And T- we invest T- for the long Tea term. Tea Party was a very quick response to some of the overreach that a lot of people believed was taking place under the Obama administration. Yeah. So that's the beauty. And this is true in a, in a lot of Western governments. Mm-hmm. I mean, France and America have a lot of difference in the political structure, but both cases, there's a uh, populist component where politicians have to respond to the people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and were you pr- impressed that I knew Mitterrand in 1981? Yeah. And you know how to say his name properly. I did. I, well, I've all of a sudden <laughs> lately been getting inundated with French pronunciations <laughs> of things around my work life. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, I think we've given listeners a great framework for how to evaluate uh, political headlines and how politics links to fundamentals, and furthermore, how maybe they should look at their own behavior when it comes to these different headlines. And uh, more often than not, uh, you should stay invested. And although all these all these headlines and all the sensationalizing maybe causes you to want to do something most often the proper response is to just do nothing uh, give us a call yeah yeah, yeah so yeah. so uh, yeah leave it at that yeah. yeah i think julian brought up some particularly very good points about our system um i wish more people would learn about civics things like that you know that we're a uh, republic we're, we're slow um <laughs> th- one of the funnier things i think about democracies and we're in california there's a ballot thing like uh what do they call two wolves and a sheep deciding what to eat for lunch. That's mm-hmm. that's a democracy, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, I, you know, we, we are a republic. We have checks and balances. The other thing that's, uh, I think, particularly important to remember is economic realities sometimes force a degree of pragmatism on leaders, right? We talked a lot about the economic crisis and what people who otherwise philosophically thought what they actually did during those periods of time. So um, leadership requires leaders. Yeah. Good well, I, I agree completely. And I do think that I'm... Um, it's understandable that there would be heightened angst around some of the political drama. I don't uh, discount people's strongly held political views that they would kind of intuitively transpose those into their view of the market. I think it's very uh, compatible with human nature. But again, as we have to talk about all the time, whether it's talking about index funds or talking about how to respond to market volatility, human nature is a failed investor. And in this case, politics exposes a lot of the sharpest realities of human nature, more so than other things do, but that can become really uh, problematic in one's invest- investment decisions. 
the uh, fact that there's a little bit of validity with some of the concerns in the legislative component and other aspects mixed in with a lot of the not so legitimate aspects, it makes it more complicated. We have to unpack a lot of that. But honestly, I think that it is very silly to worry right now about what will happen in over a year when this thing is going to take so many twists and turns. As far as I can tell, Elizabeth Warren right now is polling somewhere between 25 and 30 percent mm -hmm. as Democrat candidate. She was at four percent two and a half months ago. She was literally left for dead as a candidate after that whole in India, mm. Indian, um, mm. uh, uh, you know, DNA test de debacle and so forth. Uh, you guys remember 2008, John McCain was in fifth place. They were trying to raise money and they couldn't even get people to come to a fundraiser here in Orange County. I think at the time he was trailing the front runner. It was Rudy Giuliani. Mm. Who, who ended up not winning any states. You know, you had uh, Mike Huckabee, Mitt Romney, Fred Thompson, and fifth place, John McCain, he ended up getting the nomination. Who could forget that, uh, that Hillary Clinton is the foregone winner in the 2008, and uh, this junior senator from Illinois no one ever heard of named Barack Obama comes in and trounces her in the primary. Um, going Fast forwarding even 2016, I mean, the greatest example probably in American history is this very crass and kind of... Uh, so not just controversial, but sort of not really totally respected, mm. somewhat real estate developer, mostly reality TV star, but this kind of trust fund kid from men, from Queens ends up coming down this uh, famous escalator. And, and a lot of people, myself included, didn't take it seriously at first. And then through more and more time, people had to take it seriously. And of mm. course, he became president. So here we are right now, and it is just about to turn October of the year before the election. I think there are some outcomes that I would not be fond of as an investor and even more outcomes I would not be fond of as a citizen. There are some outcomes I could be very comfortable with as both an investor and a citizen. But so much time to go here. The idea of worrying about who's going to win the presidency in 14 months when we don't have a China trade deal, when there's all the question marks about what earnings season. I mean, Julian knows we're about to get ready for third quarter earnings results to come in. If earnings expectations are beaten by 6% quarter over quarter, markets are the last words on the market's tongue are going to be Warren and Sanders. And, and inversely, if, mm -hmm. if you have significant forward guidance worries out of earnings season, the last thing markets are going to say is, hey, we might get four more years of supply side tax policy. So really, you got to keep focus on the biggest things, not worry about, as Brian pointed out, the stuff you can't control anyways. And trust Hamilton, Madison, Jefferson. They did a wonder. And they didn't just do a wonder for the reality of how this stuff affects our portfolio. They did a wonder in creating the greatest nation on God's green earth. Thanks for listening to the Dividend Cafe.